history and it's so relevant to today. And um, let me just introduce Pro Professor Suzanne Lanny Charles. She is assistant professor in city and regional planning and her teaching and research examine physical, social and economic changes in older inner ring suburban neighborhoods. In particular, her research addresses infill redevelopment and mansionization, the financialization of housing and single family rental housing. Her current research examines whether single family rental housing provides access to spatially constituted opportunity structures in suburbia or if it reinforces segregation by race and income in the region. She has gotten grants from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies, the Institute for Social Sciences at Cornell, and the President's Council for Cornell Women. She's worked as an architect for Renzo Piano Building Workshop in Paris and as a vice president at Booth Hanson Architects in Chicago, and also as a real estate consultant at the Weizmann Group in New York City. She has both a undergrad and graduate degrees in architecture and a doctorate in planning from Harvard. Suzanne? Thank you, Linda. And welcome to this colloquium session on racial capitalism, residential segregation, and unequal access to housing in the United States. American suburbs are highly segregated. In fact, this segregation has come to the fore in our current political debate as charges of abolishing the suburbs are a not so subtle reference to suburbs segregated by race and income and efforts to keep them that way. Residential segregation is not by accident. As urban planners, we learn about redlining and other federal policies that led to segregated suburbs. But housing segregation has been going on well before redlining. Our speaker this morning, Dr. Paige Glotzer, offers a new understanding of the deeper roots of suburban segregation. In her important new book, How the Suburbs Were Segregated, Dr. Glotzer reveals how the 20th century policies that favored exclusionary housing were the culmination of a long-term effort by the real estate industry to use racism to structure suburban real estate markets. She sheds new light on the power of real estate developers in shaping the origins and mechanisms of a housing market in which racial exclusion and profit are still inextricably intertwined. These are critical issues for our city and regional planning and Baker program and real estate students. As urban planning and real estate practitioners, we simply must do better. This talk kicks off a series of discussions that we will have in CRP and the Baker Program in Real Estate, which will continue through the new housing policy course in our department next spring, when we will read Paige's book and perhaps talk with her again. Paige Glotzer is an assistant professor and the John W. and Jean M. Rowe Chair in the History of American Politics, Institutions, and Political Economy in the History Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She researches the history of housing segregation in the 19th and 20th century, and she brings together discussions of political economy, cultural history, and the spatial construction of difference. Paige received her PhD in history from Johns Hopkins University, and we are so happy to have Paige, Gl <laughs> Paige Glatzer speak with us today. So without further delay, Dr. Paige Glatzer. Well, thank you very much for um, such a generous introduction, um, and thank you for the invitation to speak here today. I'm, I'm very excited to get to um, have a good conversation with all of you and to share some of my work. Um, and before I start, just so, you know, to acknowledge we're, we're not really in any type of normal times. If you need to have family members, pets, roommates in the background at any point, um, it certainly is okay with me. So please, please don't hesitate to just live your life as you need to live it during this talk. Okay, I'm going to share my screen um, as I get started. Okay. So I don't think it's a surprise to anyone uh, here to say that American cities tend to be racially segregated. Uh, neighborhoods that are mostly, say, African American, for example, have historically uh, been uh, poorer, though not always. Um, the buildings in worse shape, they receive fewer city services and fewer financial options. Meanwhile, if you think of suburbs, they have historically been wealthier, whiter, and the site of very uh, types of investment, both public and private. So my research looks at why. Um, two questions drive my work. First is how do we account for pervasive housing segregation? And two, why does it assume certain forms and not others 
because white supremacy works in many, many different ways. And that means that segregation could also work in a multitude of ways. So why is it that housing segregation has taken on certain forms uh, in the 19th and 20th century, but not other forms? So I argue that the answers lie with the ways that some of the earliest suburban developers experimented with racial segregation as a tactic to increase sales at the turn of the 20th century. They then disseminated those practices to planners, to policymakers, to other people in the real estate industry. They standardized those practices through associations, uh, especially through real estate and planning associations. And they ultimately helped turn federal, they helped federal policymakers codify these practices into discriminatory federal housing policy during the 1930s and 40s and beyond. Now, those of you familiar with the history of American suburbs in particular might think of them as primarily a post-World War II phenomenon, but developers laid the groundwork for post-war housing discrimination long before. And I begin in the 1890s. Uh, so like any historian, I have to give the caveat that there were certainly intellectual, political, and legal precedents that informed the events of the 1890s. You can always go further and further and further back. But it was in the 1890s that realtors who played those crucial roles in mid 20th century housing policies began to gain a disproportionately large platform to shape the national housing market. And these federal policies were the ones that historians often use to account for both the rise of large segregated metropolitan areas, as well as a white consumer base that was, and in many instances still is, willing to defend housing segregation. So today I'll be highlighting the history of one developer based in Baltimore, Maryland called the Rowan Park Company. So just a little bit about them to set the stage for, for the talk. The Rowan Park Company uh, was founded in 1891 and developed over 2,500 acres in Northern Baltimore. Uh, and its officers played the key roles in the processes that I just mentioned. They helped to experiment with tactics for segregation, um, some of which were new or retooled uh, strategies. They disseminated those practices. They standardized them through associations where they were early leaders, and they worked with federal policymakers. So my work in some ways is both a case study, but also to look at a network of realtors, planners, and policymakers. So first I'll discuss a little bit more about the origins of the Rowan Park Company and how its finances shape the decisions of its managers to turn to specific forms of racial segregation. Then I'll illustrate some of the ways the company um, planned, designed, and advertised uh, their subdivision and how that gave unprecedented shape to how housing segregation worked. Then I'll look at those processes of dissemination, standardization, and I'll turn to housing policy itself and I'll end by bringing it around to our current moment, to today, and looking at some of the enduring uh, effects of this earlier history. So even though I just said that I'm uh, gonna be focusing on Baltimore, I'm actually gonna be starting, and this comes from my book, um, so chapter one of my book, How the Suburbs Are Segregated. Uh, I'm gonna be starting outside of Baltimore and actually outside of the United States. So in terms of what was happening with development in the 1890s in the United States, it was actually um, sometimes being fueled by British investment. And the Roland Park Company didn't start life as a bunch of Baltimoreans getting together and buying land. It actually started with 400 British investors, everyone from widows to mustard manufacturers to reverends to you name it, a huge cross-section of the British population was actually investing more than they had ever done before for a variety of reasons. And one and two of the areas that were seeing this kind of increased investment were in colonial activities um, and financial instruments, so things like bonds um, or mortgages. So why Baltimore? Well, it was actually just one stop um, in a line of investment uh, that were linked in some ways by the same rationale. And it's a rationale that the, the, the British end of things, the company in Britain, put into their ads. And it was that they were going to invest in, quote, 
lands in the more newly settled parts of the United States or in the colonies where the influx of population is rapidly enhancing in value. What they meant is the influx of white population um, on what they would characterize falsely as empty land. Um, and that would drive up value, making it potentially a good investment if they got in early. So this map that I'm, uh, I have here on the screen actually does a couple of things. It shows that the, some of the other places that these investors are investing in um, at the same time. But one thing I do in the project is I also want to create connections to show where the money that financed uh, Baltimore's first segregated suburb came from. And so this actually is a map that shows some of the investments of the larger investors, um, specifically Alfred Fryer and Jacob Wright, whom I talk about in my book. Um, and they had actually gotten the money that they put into Baltimore from things that had connections to enslavement, such as sugar plantations in the Caribbean, um, from imper British imperialism, such as um, government activities in India, in Egypt, in the Congo. Uh, and also many of their investments in the immediate years leading up to financing um, the Royal Park Company in Baltimore also had to do with the displacement and genocide of Native Americans in the American West, again, for white settlement. So housing discrimination in the United States, I argue, um, has to be understood not just in a national context, but actually in a longer context of race, empire, and cities. And Baltimore fit this bill. Um, Baltimore had, was rapidly growing, and if they saw, um, when they looked at Baltimore, a uh, potentially path of affluent white uh, movement to a specific part of Baltimore's periphery that was not empty in the slightest, but was portrayed as such. So why, what were the imperatives then that actually made planned suburbs look really different from what had previously been going on in terms of what it meant to build housing and develop in the United States. So I mentioned that planned segregated suburbs, were, they were actually a pretty new thing. There were some, there were planned suburbs, there was certainly segregated housing, but what was happening in the 1890s in places like Baltimore were a bit new. And this has to do with this investment. So there were different financial imperatives. Um, Baltimore builders prior to, to this time really operated on very short term uh, goals. So because of the way they got their money and because of the ways they, they had to essentially build very quickly to make money, they would essentially build a couple of lots and then try and sell it and get out. So this was different from the Roland Park Company in Baltimore that had to guarantee returns to these British investors year after year after year. And so the Roland Park Company was one of the first to turn to two tools to try and actually guarantee long-term returns. Uh, and those are planning and also restrictive covenants. So that's what they first, those are their first two tools. So I'll go into now restrictive covenants first and then I'll talk a little bit more about the planning. And this gets into the whole, what tactics are they experimenting with or retooling um, that have not, had not been really used on a wide scale before. So restrictive covenants, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, at least in passing, but at its broadest, a restrictive covenant is essentially a set of rules, um, also a community-wide set of rules that were legally binding. Now, the restrictive covenants or uh, essentially restrictions on single pieces of property had existed before, but the application of them to an entire subdivision was very rare. Um, and so, for example, uh, as an attempt at community control, they were very rare. So examples of, restric of restrictions in the Roland Park Company Covenant seem to sometimes be just strictly aesthetic um, or having to do with the kind of way things look physically. But if you read the sort of between the lines, you actually see what's gonna be a recurring pattern in this talk and in the history of housing segregation which is that the company essentially mixed up or conflated um, uses, of, uses of property and what they thought of as the qualities of people. So for instance, um, some of the restrictions were that each house had to be set back a certain amount from the street. That actually functioned as a, a type of class control because it meant that people had to buy a bigger lot in order to actually be able to have a house on it. 
um, each house had to be made of a certain material and actually each house had to have a minimum cost. Also things controlling and setting barriers to entry. But there was more. Uh, the Roland Park Company inserted one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the very first community-wide racial clauses into their restrictions. And it's a lot of text here, but um, I want to draw your attention to the paragraph in the middle um, and also just preface it that um, the word they use was the polite term for African Americans at this time. It was different from the uh, another word. Um, at no time shall the land included in said tract or any part thereof be, or any building erected thereon, be occupied by any Negro or person of Negro extraction. Um, and, and it goes on to say that that doesn't apply to domestic servants, meaning that African Americans could not um, purchase or live in houses, but they could be hired by white people and perform jobs in houses, um, including as live-in servants. Now, where this was placed in the restrictive covenant itself, I think is extremely important. So it was in a nuisance clause. Nuisances were historically um, one of the tools of municipal land regulation. When they're really prior to zoning, um, nuisances were often um, just defined as anything, any use, toxic or unhealthy that could potentially endanger other people in a city. Um, this has, this uh, is a, something that has been very much used to construct ideas of race, of disability, of gender, but it also meant that by putting it, by taking that idea of nuisance uh, as a land regulation tool and including a race restriction within it, it equates African American occupancy with what comes above and below it, as you can see here. Um, prohibitions on owning livestock and excess smoke. So it goes livestock, race, smoke. And again, that is kind of already signaling how developers are regarding people and property together in a very kind of conflated way. So this is one of the key logics to how racial segregation and housing is beginning to take shape. So this is the sort of the foundation with restrictive covenants. And this was the legal basis for um, as a contract that was used uh, to guarantee somehow long-term returns, stability, um, and there are all sorts of language um, and cleanliness, hygiene. These are languages that were permeating the ads of these developers. But I also um, want to talk a little bit about the planning that also is very much the flip side to this. It's mutually reinforcing. So to do that, I'm actually turning to a um, present-day map um, of the Roland Park Company's second development, Guilford. Um, the reason why I use the present day map is actually these boundaries, these streets are very much the way they were about 100 years ago. So it was also just, it's convenient, but we're going to come back to this map in different ways. So I wanted to draw your attention to the east side of Guilford. This street here is called Greenmount Avenue. It's also called York Road. It changes names. And the Roland Park Company erected a variety of barriers along York Road intended to separate Guilford from the pre-existing mixed race, mixed class neighborhoods on the other side of it that were older. And so this is how we actually see segregation being written into the landscape. So first, you can look at the streets. So Guilford streets, which are on the left, dead end generally at York Road. They, um, they don't continue through and they're disconnected from older pre-existing streets. So this is an intentional separation from an existing street fabric. Uh, and Guilford streets were all planned and created at once, you know, at the time of its development. I should say the only street that does go through, 39th Street, has a sewer underneath it. So we could talk a lot about the provision of infrastructure and, and the role that plays in this story. Then there's a wall. Um, again, I took that picture of the wall myself. The wall still exists. It's a, I think, about a 14 foot high wall in most places. And this was actually done, um, we, there's correspondence about this in the archive. Uh, this was done to block out so-called eyesores. Um, and again, that referred to both people and the appearance of the built environment. So, and it would also separate Guilford um, and make it very inward oriented. So people could only see folks who looked like them 
um, and lived in houses like them. Finally, there were these smaller um, attached houses set back from the street. So this was a plan for kind of thematic cluster housing uh, that was used on the, along the Guilford's Eastern boundary. Now these houses were neither small nor cheap by the general standards of Baltimore, but the interior of Guilford were detached mansions. And these are uh, attached or semi-attached uh, houses. So what this did was it um, garnered the Roland Park Company praise for actually design, um, architecturally designed cluster housing that was um, celebrated as an architectural achievement and very uh, beautiful. But it also created a de facto wall because attached housing has no spaces in between it to enter Guilford. So when you combine all of these things, the streets, the wall, the attached houses, you get essentially a solid barrier um, of over a mile of the, almost the entire eastern boundary of Guilford. And so this is, um, and again, all of this still exists today. So these are just some of the ways in which block level, street by street level planning can actually create intentional barriers uh, to, separate, um, to separate neighborhoods based on race and class uh, under the guise of essentially creating um, and maintaining the integrity of a community. Now, I mentioned that um, there's a longer history of um, race and empire that um, the Royal Park Company and, and suburbs are very much connected to. So the people who actually helped to plan Royal Park Company development were um, the Olmsted brothers. So uh, one of uh, the United States' premier landscape architecture firms, um, the, uh, so the Olmsted brothers were the sons of Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., who um, is known for designing Central Park in New York City, um, who played a role in um, the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893, which was a kind of show of American imperial power. So the Olmsted brothers did a lot of subdivision design, university campus design, but also they function as municipal planners. They work with city governments as well. So they wore different hats, often simultaneously um, in the same place. But the Olmsted also, while they were helping to plan out places like Guilford, were um, also going around the world and especially to the Caribbean um, and helping to create gated walled communities for American and British expats during the same time period. Um, so this is just one example of a proposed um, community in Cuba not long after the Spanish-American War on a disputed island called the Isle of Pines, which was claimed by both Cuba and the United States. And it has a lot of the similar features of Roland Park Company development, um, including a country club, the privatized recreational space. So that longer history um, also informs something that I'm going to gloss over a little bit here, but again, I could come back to it in the Q&A if people are interested, which is that because planners and developers were sort of moving between roles actually within um, suburban development, but also municipal planning, because it was a fairly small group of people um, at that time when planning was a fairly new feature in many municipal governments. It also meant that there were kind of specialized ties that were forming between um, the, the most well-off developers with the most capital and municipal policy makers. Municipal policy makers. So there are many instances in which part of what it meant for developers to start gaining power, that they're gaining a kind of way to shape space and resource distribution, was that they also actually altered um, municipal priorities for infrastructure, for things like sewers, lights, um, transportation routes. And that often came at the expense of people who potentially had been um, making a strong case for why they needed it more, such as in Baltimore, sewers were originally laid, um, planned to first serve people whose neighborhoods were most likely to suffer from epidemics um, of the yellow fever. Um, of various diseases that were only beginning to really be understood very well as germ theory was new. But those priorities were shifted to give sewers to Roland Park developments first, even when that sometimes was legally dubious. And that 
speaks to a whole process by which the Roland Park Company, um, fairly typically amongst the time, was able to gain certain types of privileged access to the planners and city government. So to kind of switch a little bit back to some of those processes I mentioned earlier, so this is kind of the early experimenting and planning stages, but um, there was also a way in which uh, this started to create, the Roland Park Company helped to start create, creating um, an informal network uh, in which people could share ideas and also move from project to project to apply their ideas. And chief amongst those ideas that were being circulated were of the um, value of restrictive covenants. So this is, um, again, I know this document has a lot of text, um, but what I wanna, we don't have to read it all, but what I want to draw your attention to is that this is um, a Roland Park Company restrictive covenant that a planner named John Nolan, um, who became a, a quite powerful and notable planner in the early 20th century, a, a white developed, a white planner, um, took the Roland Park Restrictive Covenant, crossed out Roland Park, um, and he just wrote Florida on it as part of a development that he was gonna be doing in Clearwater, Florida. So there's actually a very concrete dissemination of restrictive covenants that you can follow through these correspondence networks and see how then um, things like racial restrictions actually spread through various channels. Um, and Nolan was another one of the planners who wore many hats and developed and worked for city governments, uh, did university campuses, worked in um, subdivision design. So again, there was that kind of very sort of easy slipping between different roles that helped to kind of shape the dissemination of ideas and gave people a platform that others did not have. But there are some other examples of this, which don't necessarily have corresponding kind of good slides. Um, so the architects of New York City zoning laws wrote to the Roland Park Company and said, we actually love your restrictive covenants. We think they're a great example of land use. We would like to study them as we plan out New York City zoning laws. Um, one of the architects in New York City zoning laws taught the very first planning courses at Columbia University, George Burdett Ford. So the Roland Park Company's restrictive covenants were part of the curriculum to train the first generation of university trained planners. Um, and their restrictive covenants were not the only ones, Ford aggregated them. Um, so if you all um, at Cornell were actually taking your planning courses uh, back in 1913, 1914, you would probably be studying restrictive covenants for how good they were. Um, and then, then also the um, Olmsted brothers also were instrumental, um, again, not the only ones, in adapting tools like this to local circumstances. So Baltimore's racial um, hierarchies, like the, the geography of race in Baltimore was very much one that was predominantly recognized by people at the time as African-American, and white. Now, those terms change over time, but it was very much a city that was considered to be black and white. Um, when the Olmsted brothers, they went to California with a very, very different potential um, racial geography and kind of understanding of what racial hierarchy meant, they helped to actually adapt um, restrictive covenants to exclude Mexicans, um, which is not something that would happen in Baltimore. So there's also a local piece that's maintained here as these are flexible and adaptable practices that were then rearranged to enforce and bolster different types of segregation in local contexts as well. So, and what you get then are, um, in addition to restrictive covenants, this is just a picture of um, a sewer in Baltimore. Right before it opened, people would drive through it very ceremoniously to show the technological grandeur of a giant plant sewer system. So I, I thought that was pretty neat to include. But the sewer tells a story actually about resource distribution, about environmental racism, and et cetera, in Baltimore. So the circulation of these processes, people, ideas, and planning instruments uh, were informal at first. But beginning in around 1908, 1909, there was a big effort amongst uh, people in the real estate and in, who work in real estate to try and actually come together to form a national 
organization. And that was called the National Association of Real Estate Boards. Um, it still exists today. It's called the National Association of Realtors, and they're based in Chicago. So the National Association of Realtors um, was trying to at first counter a widely held um, view that people in real estate were not to be trusted or respected. Um, the popular view of real estate agents was that they were swindlers, uh, scam scam artists. They were called sharks, uh, fly-by-nighters, uh, and Narab sought to change that image by establishing real estate as a profession. So they wanted to professionalize real estate. And over the 1910s and 1920s, that was actually one of its main goals. So that's when you saw the establishment of real estate licensing laws. That was a narrative effort at the state and sometimes local level. Um, it is when you see the first real estate textbooks um, on things like appraisal and valuation. Uh, and it's also when uh, realtors sought linkages with academia, with economists, with, um, with planners who had done this a little bit earlier to try and again, not only bolster the reputation of real estate, but try to expand it into what could be its own sort of body of knowledge. Um, in fact, uh, JC Nichols, who was a, a suburban developer in Kansas City, um, who was very much a peer of um, the Roland Park Company in that he did very big plan segregated suburbs for affluent white people. He called this realology. He said, real estate um, needs to develop realology. Um, to essentially be the sort of body of knowledge that would propel uh, realtors into the role of professionals. Because many of these people were not necessarily trained in any way, but they were drawing from their business experience. So they were trying to make it for the future, that in the future people would essentially come with some standardized knowledge of real estate. So this also meant then that through this effort, um, realtors, and I, I say the word realtors, realtor as a trademark term was an invention of the National Association of Real Estate Boards as a, a gatekeeping measure. So only those people who passed the licensing exam and essentially met certain criteria and paid their dues to be a member of their real estate board could call themselves a realtor. So it was supposed to be a, a sort of mark of trustworthiness and a certain credential. So that's why I'll, I'll use the term realtor to describe them. Um, but this was a segregated organization from the start. So you're already talking about essentially an association that's thinking nationally and is excluding a large body of people who uh, may be also practicing real estate in various ways. So what did realtors think of themselves because of this push? So we can get an idea of what realtors thought of themselves and what they were doing from their own literature. This image is my favorite image that's in the book, but um, you get to see it in color here, uh, which was extensive. They put in a big effort if they printed this in color in 1925. So first, for, for, since I'm a historian, I, I sometimes take it for granted that images are data. So just before I even talk about it, um, this image, this is an archival document that I found in Chicago. It tells us a lot, even though there were no numbers here. So we can analyze this image as a source to understand things such as the hopes and dreams and aspirations of realtors, um, how they saw themselves in relation to other people, what they saw their duties as, and what they saw their accomplishments as. Um, so first of all, the realtor is supposed to be um, a white man who is um, essentially bringing progress, holding a car, right? So he's holding some of the latest technology. But he's dressed in classical garb. So he's also supposed to be somehow like very knowledgeable, potentially, you, you often hear realtors say civilized, again, which is a, something that's laden with understandings of race, of class. So the civilized realtor holding progress and surrounded by scenes that realtors were responsible for. So you can see the Detroit skyline with its belching smokestacks. You see happy industrial workers, all of whom are white industrial workers in 1920s Detroit. Um, but you also see a suburb. Um, you see a house that could be in Roland Park, and you see a white nuclear family, a mother, a father, and a child. So this is what realtors consider to be the best, the, their, their demonstration of their best. 
So already you can tell how some of the values that are underlying realology, the professionalization of real estate, are drawing on their older business practices and attempting to essentially standardize it into what is good and valuable and what it, what it means for a realtor to be a civic leader. So that is how they saw themselves. Upstanding. They saw themselves as upstanding. Now, along with this image, though, realtors also adapted a code of ethics, which was a common practice amongst um, standard uh, organizations or, or bodies of people who tried to professionalize. So a code of ethics about how they should behave. Um, and this is where you actually see racial segregation being written directly and explicitly into this code. So the code of ethics, which was adopted in 1924, just a year before this image, included um, one line that said, quote, a realtor could not introduce into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, or any individual whose presence will clearly be detrimental to the property values in that neighborhood. So realtors, regardless of any individual um, beliefs, were duty bound to enforce um, and practice uh, racial segregation, class segregation, and they had a lot of latitude to use that widely. So again, that was then adaptable to local circumstances, understanding the conditions of what this meant. This also tells us something about the link between people, place, and property values. So this is worded as a way of saying realtors protect property value. And it's already saying that the thing that will lower property values is mixing races, mixing nationalities, and also it says property and occupancy. So again, the whole conflating the use of a property with the people who may live there is very much a core of what determines property values according to realtors. So segregation was supposed to safeguard or enhance property value. Now, this again was the res uh, responsibility of realtors to do, and if they did not do it, they could be expelled from the National Association of Real Estate Boards, no longer be able to call themselves a realtor, and it would be potentially very hard for them to stay in business. But based on, on a lot of the um, literature and debates and meeting minutes of the National Association, um, there isn't necessarily a lot of resistance to this clause that's recorded at all. And I think that's very important to note that even though this was something that people had to do, there not, wasn't necessarily a lot of um, recorded saying we don't want to do it. This was voted on and won by a majority of votes to be a part of the Code of Ethics. In my work, though, I think um, I, I make the case that it's important not just to look at the sort of what's going on in official meetings, or what's going on at, um, in, say, publications where we see realtors sort of trying to depict what they want themselves to be seen as, it's also important to just see what they do when they gather together. Because as a very large body that's sort of gaining power and standardizing sort of ways of seeing people and property, it also meant that there were probably other ways in which we can understand how racism was at work uh in kind of establishing what real estate how real estate functioned so what i also do in my book is i look at um the annual convention of the national association of realtors uh, and the conventions is are places exactly where you see gatherings large gatherings of realtors from across the country actually from the u.s and canada up through the 1950s before canada split off to do its own thing um, and it's where realtors really kind of are able to form a professional identity, even outside of the halls of meetings. So realtors connected convention business with what they did as part of the leisure program um, at these conventions as well. So after a day of discussing restrictive covenants um, or property value or sales taxes, they joined together and go to programs like what this advertised a treat of thrills. Um, and this is from the Kentucky Convention from 1928. And what you see here are essentially various images that are drawn from um, a form of entertainment in American culture called minstrel shows. 
uh, minstrel shows, which um, included, essentially, which originated uh, in essentially celebrations uh, and nostalgia for slave plantations. Uh, included essentially depicting African Americans as um, in a whole bunch of kind of set tropes. And the term Jim Crow itself, Jim Crow was a minstrel character. So that's where we, we, get, we get the term Jim Crow from uh, sets of images and performances like these. So what you see here are um, the promises of entertainment um, put on surely by people in wearing blackface um, that exaggerate um, stereotypical um, and negatively connotate, connoted features of African American um, faces. Um, and you can see a bunch of tropes here that were repeatedly used to justify um, segregation and white supremacy, uh, including um, you see one person eating a watermelon, you see people talking in dialect, meaning that it was the expectation that people couldn't talk right, as you would see so on and so forth. So there is a lot to break down this image, but that's the sort of context in which realtors are going to have fun at this convention. White realtors, because again, this was a segregated association. So this means that when thinking about why, uh, why real estate is segregated, why housing is segregated, keeping in mind the kind of the multitude of ways in which uh, folks involved in real estate we're seeing and thinking about race and racism really helps to also explain sometimes why they why it was such a central feature to their business because at the end of the day it was a central feature to their worldview as well and um, racism is in real estate very often most frequently took the forms of anti-black racism but race itself, racism is often, it's hierarchical, meaning that um, blackness was at the bottom of a kind of complicated and very shifting way of how people order um, others in the United States. And so prior to World War II also, the term white uh, meant some different things than it might now. And so there were, there were additional tools of exclusion that guided the sales tactics of the Roland Park Company, but also across the country. So here I'm pulling up two things called exclusion files. Exclusion files were not public facing, like restrictive covenants. These were inter-office documents, not available to the public. Restrictive covenants were available to the public. And it is where salespeople evaluated folks who seemed like at first they could be residents of a Roland Park subdivision. They probably had the money for it. They were making inquiries they were interested in. But something tipped off a salesperson that maybe, maybe this person wasn't quite, um, wasn't quite a good fit. And they would investigate, usually behind their the back, which was legal. Um, and they would arrive at the conclusion that, oh no, this person was Jewish, or this person is um, uh, Italian, but the wrong type of Italian. They like look too Italian. They don't assimilate or blend well. And so these would be disqualifications. And sometimes, the residents, the, the prospective resident would never be told. They would just be, they would never call them back. And we have all these files to see how case by case this was worked out. Um, but a few things that are really important here, it gives you a kind of broader sense of how exclusion was working on the ground, day by day, salesperson by salesperson. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity in this file. But African Americans, again, were excluded blankets by restrictive covenant as a group, whereas people who were potentially of dubious whiteness were always given a case-by-case -case evaluation and treated as individuals to potentially be kind of weighed with maybe exceptions in mind. So what you see is even though this is a racial hierarchy, it's always being done with a very, very prominent anti-blackness kind of hanging over what's guiding these other types of exclusions as well. They function differently. And that's part of how they all work together to paint the kind of larger picture of how housing segregation worked and changed over time. I should mention too, um, in terms of racial context, um, there was, since Baltimore was mainly black and white, they really knew how to, and, and there were large Jewish populations, Italian populations, Greek populations, all of them were in here. The Royal Park Company knew how to potentially handle all that. But when something didn't fit into that racial hierarchy, um, local hierarchy, such as the prospective Chinese buyers that showed up um, to buy a house, 
things got really confusing for the salesman. Um, and they actually pulled residents. And it was, so what they did was essentially they, they evolved the decision to what they could then say was, well, just the popular will of the neighborhood when they themselves didn't necessarily know how to factor in, say, Chinese buyers. If you went to, again, a place like Los Angeles or San Francisco, you would not, you would have things play out very differently because again, understandings of that hierarchy were different in, local, in different places. However, even though exclusion files were inherently about kind of the local contingency, the segregation, this was a national advertisement for a filing cabinet for exclusion files called Prospect Files um, in one of the National Association of Real Estate Boards uh, publications. So in terms of standardizing practice, this is a way you see a kind of both attention and a way that ideas filtered up and down um, to essentially solidify the day-by-day -day mechanisms of housing segregation. But how did that all become federal policy? So by the 1930s, the early, by the onset of the Great Depression, NARIP had positioned itself as essentially the industry, the leaders of real estate, um, and the people who would potentially know best um, as, as experts, as specialists, in how to essentially craft um, major policies about real estate. When the Great Depression happened, um, beginning in 1929, a few housing was an extremely important part of the nation's economy. Um, and when it tanked, it also was part of the potential downfall of banking and lending because um, so much of um, so many of the assets of a lot of lenders were tied up in mortgages. And so what happened was the federal government, um, beginning in the early 1930s, wanted to potentially bail out banks and provide assistance to people who's more, who were in danger of losing their mortgages. They then, for the first time, acted as a direct lender. And they did that through an, uh, an, an agency called the Homeowners Loan Corporation. Let me go back a sec. Homeowners Loan Corporation, or HULC, H-O-L-C. And the federal government decided that they were going to establish criteria for what were considered potentially mortgages that they wanted to purchase from banks and directly handle themselves, thus helping banks and helping homeowners, and which ones they would potentially not want to do it or do it on, on worse terms, on favorable terms. So they came up with criteria, and then they mapped that criteria um, across 200 cities um, in the country, and they gave areas grades based on what they deemed to be risky, meaning it didn't fit their really good, like their criteria really well for good mortgages, or not risky, meaning actually these would probably be mortgages that are gonna get paid off, property value is great, property value is gonna continue to be great, even with hard financial times. So this gives us redlining. I chose a map of Brooklyn for this. Ithaca didn't have a redlining map made of it. The closest areas were um, Binghamton, uh, Elmira and Johnson City. So, but I, I figure I'll go with where I'm from. I'm from Brooklyn. So this is Brooklyn's redlining map. So the summary of um, redlining, uh, or I should say, why is it called redlining? It's because the areas that were graded red on the map were the ones that were considered to be the quote unquote riskiest areas with potentially the worst future prospects for property in that area. What was the main, one of the main criteria for determining if an area was worthy of federal assistance? It was race. But there were a lot of other criteria um, that seemed colorblind, such as houses maybe were set back from the street, um, were made of certain materials, uh, cost a certain amount, that they were single family detached houses in suburban like settings. They came from restrictive covenants. So a lot of criteria that made it into redlining actually directly came from restrictive covenants, also came from zoning, but zoning came from restrictive covenants. So it's all kind of a mixed up, sort of unfortunate mess of criteria that is unduly influenced by early segregated suburbs on the justification of what property value is worth more or less. 
So the whole idea of people, property, and uses being all conflated together becomes the core of which areas get federal um, mortgage assistance and which don't during the Great Depression. So in Baltimore, um, uh, all the Roland Park Company areas are rated very well. The strip along York Road, which I'm, I'm kind of showing you now, is yellow, and there's a red-lined area underneath. The two green areas you see on the Baltimore, this little portion of the Baltimore redlining map, um, were both Roland Park Company developments, um, Guilford and then Northwood to the right. So this was in the 1930s. I should also mention before I go any further, a couple of things. Other agencies, um, federal agencies adopted Hulk redlining criteria. So it meant that these criteria, which were essentially set up during the Great Depression, lasted um, because they then uh, formed the criteria for two other agencies, the Federal Housing Administration, which extended this to all private lenders and lasted way beyond the Great Depression, um, and also the Veterans Administration, who gave out mortgages to veterans returning from World War II, used this criteria, meaning that oftentimes um, Black veterans did not receive the same types of access to suburban housing that white veterans did. So, and also NAREB literature formed the core of Hulk literature. Hulk members attended NAREB conventions on paid time. Um, in Baltimore, eight of 10 um, of the people who worked on um, Baltimore's map had ties to the Roland Park Company. So what is happening here? Um, so I mentioned that Roland Park Company was green. Um, most of Baltimore was actually rated red, um, especially all of the areas that contained any, any area with over 10% um, of a population of African-American residents was automatically redlined. So in its first year though, um, of the Federal Housing Administration using this criteria, 68.8% of all Roland Park Company business was actually done through FHA insured mortgages. So to bring things forward, isn't all of this illegal now? So why does any of this matter? It's all illegal now. Um, well, hmm, yes and no. So in 1948, restrictive covenants, racially restrictive covenants were ruled unenforceable, not illegal. So they continued through the post-war moment, um, up through the Fair Housing Act. Um, and you can read Kiyanga Yamada Taylor's wonderful book um, about how the Fair Housing Act also did not solve that at all. In fact, created new means for segregation after fair housing. Um, the FHA removed explicit racial language um, from its criteria, but it actually continued to discriminate. Um, NAREB also revised its code of ethics in 1950 to um, remove race from that, that line that I gave you earlier. But what it said instead was, a realtor should not be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character or property of use which will be detrimental to property values in the neighborhood. Occupancy was a type of use. This was changed specifically to preserve the status quo while being legally defensible. Redlined areas also then became the most um, likely to be demolished during urban renewal and redevelopment projects throughout the mid 20th century. They were cheapest for cities to condemn because their property values were also lowest and they were some of the areas with the least amount of political power. So where does that bring us today? A lot of the boundaries that we can see on redlining maps, and we saw earlier predating redlining maps are still in place. And so this is, this is Guilford on the right. This is a block away from Guilford on the left with a house about to be foreclosed. So again, there are other ways you can map the enduring effects of redlining, but also look at why redlining took the shape that it did. So going back to those borders that I mentioned earlier and how the redlining map kind of takes some of those borders, we can find York Road without it being on maps just from looking at a variety of map uh, data. So this is the racial distribution of Baltimore in, in 2011. You can find York Road at the hard barrier where Baltimore's northern section goes from vast majority white to majority black. Mortgage foreclosures during the 2008 housing crisis. You can find York Road from where there are fewer mortgage foreclosures to where there is a huge glut of it. 
And during that crisis, there was something often called reverse redlining, which um, I won't get into now, but the result of it was that during the subprime housing crisis, uh, generally um, African-American homeowners were most likely to lose their homes to foreclosure and it wiped out generational wealth for um, many, many, many people. But I also wanna end with this tree map because trees are not only municipal resources like sewers that are often maintained by city government, but they also have huge environmental and quality of life implications that create some of the most um, striking disparities that you can see um, in neighborhoods that are majority white um, and planned suburbs like Guilford on the left, where you can see it's tree cover and you can see it's outline. Um, and then you can see York Road again, where the trees fall off. Um, recent studies have shown that uh, red line areas will disproportionately bear the brunt of climate change in the United States in part because they are hotter and this tree cover is a way of also getting at that. So just to conclude, <clears throat> throughout this talk, I've mentioned different types of investments, developments, policies, um, and I've shown how uh, essentially early instances of uh, capital connected to enslavement, empire, imperialism, helped to fuel the rise of Jim Crow um, in regards to segregated housing and the way that that took on a modern form in the form of segregated suburbs and cities that were often um, subject to uneven disinvestment based often on race. So developers gained preferential access and with more resources um, and race was codified into the very logic of property value, which then provided all sorts of later colorblind justifications for maintaining segregation. The legacies of these, uh, the legacies of, of these early, um, of this early history lives on. And I said that it wouldn't be surprising that um, cities are segregated and suburbs are segregated, but the ascendance of the single family house to the planned segregated suburb um, being the most valuable in terms of property value and the most desirable was not inevitable in the 1890s. And it was not inevitable, um, so we must understand why it persists decades later. So I bring together those discussions of investment, institutions, and planning um, to provide a, a way of de-essentializing racism in housing, and instead provide a granular analysis of how it became foundational to the ways that housing was valued, imagined, bought, and sold in the 20th century. So I, I often think there's um, a mischaracterization of how racism works, that it's like individuals twirling their mustaches in a back room, but we see that actually that's, it's not like that um, often. It's very structural, it's systemic, but it's also very mundane and very local at times. Uh, so racism was often just quotidian. It informed the connections between investment and urban growth, daily managerial decisions, the work of building professional institutions, and the mechanisms of government resource distribution. And as we see in maps like this tree map, it continues to shape the landscape itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paige. Now uh, you see why I wanted the real estate students to be here, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. A pretty uh, hard to hear indictment of the, the history of, um, of planning and, um, and real estate. And uh, uh, I, so, um, now is our question and answer period. Um, and uh, please, um, uh, you can either raise your blue hand icon if you have a question, or, um, well, raise the blue hand icon, that would be easier, and I, I will call on you to keep it orderly. But um, Una Kim has uh, posted a question in the chat. Una, would you like to ask it of Paige? Yeah, um, thank you for your talk, it was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering that you said that in the 1900s, there was a shift to focus on long-term investments. And um, what I've known is, were there, there's some readings that talk about the um, integrated housing um, residential during after the Civil War. So it was, it was common for the blacks and whites to live together. And I was wondering what made that um, shift like why did suddenly um having a segregated residential area was seen as a better investment mm -hmm. that's a really great question um and i i am indebted to some of the scholars who worked on this who came before me such as um 
whose first name I forget, um, Sorting the New South City is a great book for this um, uh, by a scholar whose last name is Hanchett, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the first name. Um, so what happened um, in housing uh, parallels what happened in kind of broader American history between the end of the Civil War and let's say about 1920. Um, cities, uh, and they generally were cities, you didn't necessarily have suburbs, suburbs yet, were also just smaller, they were physically smaller. So people lived in close proximity to one another, often being able to either walk to work or take some fairly limited transportation to work. Um, this meant that if you, in general, it gives the impression that cities were um, pretty integrated. However, at a kind of closer block by block sort of analysis, um, while that actually is much more true than what happened um, later, there actually is still um, different patterns of segregation just at a much smaller scale. And you see this in differences between um, the locations in Baltimore um, of houses on alleys versus houses on main streets, um, for instance. So you, you do see some segregation. But what changed to give us the Forbes that I'm talking about? Um, well, uh, part of it had to do with essentially the end of uh, Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow in which there were um, some extremely um, violent um, attempts uh, to dispossess African Americans of property and political power um, throughout the country, not just in the South, though uh, many of the documented instances are in the South. And so this coincided with um, a couple of things, industrial, some increased industrialization, changes in transportation technology, and city annexations. So cities were able to get larger and larger. They were in some ways more and more industrial in some locations, or at the very least, they were more, um, they had more varied sort of uses than they did previously. And uh, right around that time, you see essentially a whole discourse arising around the need to separate black and white bodies on the basis of things such as racial mixing would lead to the demise of the white race or racial mixing would lead to African-Americans regaining the political power they momentarily had after the Civil War. Um, within African-American communities, you also saw a lot of class tensions because class was is very flat um, in late 19th century African-American communities because the wealthiest African-Americans still had immense obstacles to um, say gathering and retaining wealth. So you also had an effort to, as cities spread out in general, you had an effort to essentially try to shift color, the color line as they existed to potentially have um, on behalf of wealthy African Americans to move into areas that had also recently been potentially vacated by um, affluent white people um, in an attempt to not live near recently arrived migrants to cities. So as everything is growing, it also means that along the um, borders of those neighborhoods, you see tremendous amounts of, of violence directed at African Americans on the basis of things like hygiene, protection of property, um, and, and various related things. So suburban developers, when they were coming in, it wasn't necessarily typical that developers can be able to plan a whole track. So I am afraid the rural car company was never typical of what was possible in Baltimore, but they did pick up on and kind of enhance and heighten and retool many of those sort of um, racial, essentially the way that race worked in Baltimore and other cities at the, in, at the beginning of Jim Crow, at the complete and total essential disenfranchisement of African Americans in many states. And so what you had there then was a ready-made set of appeals about that it could essentially be done to create a homogenous community and then say that was safe and that was stable and that was good and that was healthy. Um, what you have though, those, those um, conversations don't go away and actually Baltimore remains a place where the color line shifts constantly in part because of organized black activism um, and as one of the birthplaces of the NAACP but it also shapes things like zoning, which also helps to create segregated larger cities in different ways. Baltimore was the home of a huge fight over whether cities could legally use racial zoning to say, this block is black, this block is white, and if you move here or there, you can go to jail. 
that um, was another major factor in direction and trends and growth of cities in the early 20th century and contributed to the specific forms of segregation. Chastity, would you like to ask your question? Hey, can you, can you hear, me? hear me? Oh, 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 oh. sweet. Um, so I, uh, Suzanne, I guess this is for both of you. Um, so, you know, looking back, I think there are all, still a lot of subtle ways that we um, continue to kind of impede on a lot of generational mobility. Um, so whether it was through like, you know, reverse redlining or through subprime mortgage lending, I think even now in Atlanta, we're seeing a lot of uneven economic recovery because of REO to rental strategy. Um, and they still look eerily similar to some of those hold maps. Um, what can we do in the private sector to prevent some of these vicious cycles? Yes, um, I, I, I always both dread and like being asked the question of what can we do? Because I like, oh, I know the past. Um, but there are, I think a few, there, there should be a few type of anti-racist practices and tools um, that can maybe be part of um, any consideration people get to make, especially as you potentially gain positions of power, be it in the public sector or the private sector. And honestly, and this sounds almost inane, but it's super important, listen to people. Um, center the voices of, um, of activists, of, of people who have historically been marginalized, because they've been fighting this fight for generations. And you're probably not going to think of anything they haven't thought of before, but they haven't necessarily gotten the weight into power that perhaps a planner has or a developer has for some of the reasons I talked about. So start by listening and taking seriously the idea that maybe the most equitable thing to do will potentially clash with some of the assumptions you have about how planning or development should ideally work. But those ideals come from this racist history and they are meant to essentially further the profits for a few um, at the expense of the many. So listen and take that seriously. And the second is um, think about the, those assumptions behind things like property value. So when making decisions with, I'm sure, reams of numerical data, the assumptions of the models themselves may be rather flawed, um, right? So why is something being considered valuable? Is that tied to an assumption about, say, affordable housing will do X and Y to a piece of property? that a certain type of zoning variance will do X and Y to value. Why is value determined the way it is? And so that may be also a way to reorient some decision-making to um, potentially more equitable processes. Thank you so much. I just wanna jump on that, that in my courses, both my courses recently, we've been talking about highest and best use and what that means. Um, and I also want to, we're, we'll also, you know, highest misuse for whom generally that term is used to mean financial profitability. But, um, you know, in, in some courses, uh, uh, you know, I'm teaching and next spring, uh, Ernst Fowler will, will teach a course where we take a much different approach to understanding what the highest and best use or is. <laughs> um, Sunil, would you like to ask your question? Hi. Yeah, uh, my question was regarding uh, uh, what makes a sub suburban area beautiful is the uh, beautifully planned master plan communities and the housing in that area. So uh, do you say that uh, the entire idea of master plan community with walls and beautiful things, that idea itself is a bad idea or only that uh, segregation part that uh, uh, takes that black Americans or other people away, only that is the uh, wrong part in that? Um, you're, you're kind of cutting it out there a little bit for me. I'm so sorry. Um, the, uh, would you be able to just um, repeat that or um, a yeah, little yeah. more loudly? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, it's a little better. Sorry. Yeah. And I'm leaning in as if it says anything, but yes. <laughs> So uh, what makes a suburban area beautiful is that uh, the uh, beautiful raw houses and master plan communities in that. So uh, are you saying that that uh, entire master plan community is a bad idea or only that uh, the way they segregate black Americans from the other people, only that is the wrong part in that? Uh, that's a great question. Um, planning is not inherently good or bad or anything. It's the process of planning specifically, including master planning. Um, that can be can further 
um, segregation and, and, and expropriation, or it can potentially actually be more towards equity. It's, I think, perfectly possible to have a planned, beautiful community that is done in a potentially equitable way that potentially even redresses some of the historic wrongs of a place but it's probably going to be a little hard because it might mean doing something mean deviating from any type of master planning strategies that um you know well or easiest so i would say that i think there are certainly absolutely possibilities in planning um and there have been um i think there have been examples of which of course i'm gonna blank on in this talk where you can potentially um, even sort of work into the planning process um, uh, potential ways to potential means of redress um, also historical acknowledgement right um, you in thinking about what master planning can be can also consider how a master plan community is real is in relation to its surrounding communities right so those relationships are another moment, right? Just like those boundaries at Greenmount Avenue, New York Road, is another moment to think about how can planning a place actually have an impact, an impact you potentially can control to some extent on a wider area um, and on a wider group of people that might be directly involved in the process as you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tatanka, would you like to ask your question? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm I'm really happy to be here and be part of this conversation. Um, I'm currently the head of uh, culture and development for uh, in a city in Texas who was designated to be an African American, um, you know, community uh, city. And um, at the moment, I'm working on non gentrification programs and I'm working on, you know, development. I think a lot of the things you guys are saying is very beautiful and I think it's definitely on the right track. Something for me, um, it is about kind of creating a sensitivity as kind of almost, you know, having this uh, sensitivity to, to what those subjects are. Now, some people talked about them and some other people don't talk about them. I'm involved with a real development group where I'm creating a cultural art district in an African American community who's already been gentrified. Now, at the end of the day, I think I use the word intentions a lot. And I think the word intentions, there's things that don't really take any monetary uh, support or, or backing to create these intentions. Um, some, of the, some of the things that we're actually doing is creating a cultural uh, center where each and one of the businesses that are being developed on the east side, on the area, we're actually bringing all of those job fairs into that community space. Now, that gives the access to the actual community that we're working at and the people that are surrounding us to empower them to have the opportunities to have any other jobs or any other growth potential in the neighborhood. Um, and part of those other things is also changing the narrative of how these applications are said by eliminating, for example, what your gender is, what your ethnicity is, what your color of skin is, um, and make it into more of a general you know, idea for us is, you know, kind of pushing forward more of, you know, that we are all one. At the end of the day, we want to be combined. We want this to be something where, um, you know, we're integrating all races, we're integrating all qualities and, you know, and doing them as such. So what I would like to ask is, you know, what are some of those other ideas that you would think immediately can create an impact um, based on intentions? Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of intention, my first thought also goes to how, um, how are resources and how is money going to be distributed to not only sustain and prioritize um, initiatives such as the ones that um, you're hard at work on, but how is that going to essentially be safeguarded in the future? For instance, how is a cultural center going to continue to get funding, right, what, potentially as um, maybe some of the stakeholders and players change, right? So how can um, and I think of this in terms of like, for instance, with redlining, right, which is about intentions to segregate rather than intentions to integrate. Um, that was about controlling purse strings. So in terms of essentially um, creating priorities, but also then creating um, 
mechanisms and safeguards to have those priorities be sort of um, reinforced with funding priorities, I think is super critical. Um, and I think gentrification is exactly one of those areas where so much work can potentially be done um, with, with funding, with money, because a lot of gentrification is also fueled by types of institutional investment and the promise of urban growth. So that's gonna require rewriting the narrative of things like growth. It's gonna be require, you know, rewriting the narrative of um, where, how does equity potentially relate to affordability, right? So what does it mean when a city can say, yeah, we're not completely, we're not affordable at all like San Francisco, but we're doing a great job, right? That's a narrative that's not necessarily showing priorities um, that, that maybe it can with, the, with different intent. So I think that on the ground work, right, project to project, something like exactly a cultural center where people get brought together, looking at the structure of forms, applications, right, that, that's the criteria question. How can you potentially create a narrative and shift priorities and intent with the sort of hoops and the criteria that people jump through in order to say, live or work or go to school in the area. So by playing with those um, and, and reprioritizing those, you get those sort of mon potentially things that seem mundane or even bureaucratic compounding over time to make a huge difference. Um, but I will say that one issue that I think is potentially a little, um, is, very, is, is very complicated, right, is that issue of colorblindness. Because there, how does that intersect with restorative justice, right? Um, because colorblindness also potentially needs to not just counter segregation, but needs to essentially continue to redress the sort of different conditions it has left us with. Right, for people. So I think that one of the hardest things to do when working to create really integrated communities that are economically integrated, not just sort of integrated by presence or proximity, is also to think about what, um, what extra sort of narratives and resources and considerations need to be sustained in order to actually create justice rather than just mixed presence. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I, I, I really appreciate that. Um... What we're doing some of those things is actually you know we are we're creating things for the children and you know the other african-american communities that are here um, from how to manage their money how to open up a bank account and mm -hmm. kind of start teaching the language i feel that you know for 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 me is something where i have to have the right intentions behind it how can we you know let's just say i have real estate power towards a whole neighborhood where we are actually, you know, creating incubators for some of these, you know, African American communities and families or whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, the intentions of waking up every single day and doing the right thing is something that would, at the end of the day, would invest a little seed in someone's, you know, way of going about their day or going about things. And I think that you know, little by little will spread to everyone. So thank you so much. You guys are saying amazing and beautiful things. And I think in order for something good to happen, sometimes something bad has to happen, but hopefully we can create change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jason Rierick, would you like to ask your question? Well, my question was uh, kind of along the lines of uh, representation. Uh, have you seen a correlation uh, between line maps and you know say gerrymandered uh, state local federal uh, districts you know uh, limiting uh, these already minority voices uh, yes um, and I believe that uh, I forget I'm very bad with names I believe there um, I have a couple of colleagues at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee so I'm, I'm in Madison but Milwaukee who are actually working on the correlations between um, voter activity and participation and um, historical housing segregation. So I, I could get those names, um, but I think it's some of their, their findings are exactly that. There's a very strong correlation between um, redlining and between um, attempted disenfranchisement through things like gerrymandering, um, as well as um, kind of very, very much sort of, again, like very much 19th century style attempts to like racially disenfranchise people um, on the assumption that they may vote a certain way. So in Wisconsin, for instance, areas that were redlined also were most likely to have voting machines taken out of their districts, um, making it harder to vote. So there are all sorts of on the ground things there. 
Um, also, there are some indirect ways that redlining influences essentially political power. So because of a multitude of variables that create that redlining has sort of helped to foster in terms of um, things such as over policing of dispossession of how crime and law and order is talked about, you also have higher rates of incarceration amongst people in redlined areas. Depending on the state, people who, have, who are incarcerated lose their voting rights. So you also potentially have, um, and so I'm in Florida, there, there's been a very protracted um, legal battle in Florida about um, people with, uh, who are incarcerated, will they be able to vote in November? Um, that is being done while people look at maps of where, where these folks live, 100%. So I think there are a lot of ways that when you also then get into how housing and housing segregation is at the center of a web related to jobs, schools, um, political representation, taxation, right? Um, redlined areas tend to actually be over appraised in terms of how much people pay into property taxes, but undervalued when people try to sell their home, right? Like you get all of these sort of what you might consider proxy variables that correlate politics with redlining, but actually just scratching the surface, you see the, the roles that essentially housing segregation plays in all of these factors. Alvino, would you like to ask your question? Uh, hi there. I really enjoyed your talk, um, and I, you know, saw some of this reflected in my own life, which ties into my question. So uh, I partially grew up in the suburbs of Atlanta in a neighborhood called Providence Plantation uh, over in Alpharetta. Uh, we were the only black people in the neighborhood, um, and a moment that sticks with me from my childhood is when I got jumped by five white kids with uh, tennis rackets. Um, even though that happened, you know, I'm, of course, of the belief that uh, integration, diversity is an asset. It's not, you know, uh, anything bad. I think it actually helps communities. It helps bring us together, right? That's the only way forward. Um, but what role should local and state governments play in integrating communities through incentives and subsidies uh, if some groups want to separate themselves from those deemed less desirable? I mean, even our president was recently tweeting about how uh, the suburban housewives won't like when Cory Booker comes to their neighborhood to bring low income housing. Right, right. Cory Booker, who has helped gentrification on a massive scale. So, um, yeah, um, there's an interesting, I'll kind of go, and thank you for sharing also um, your, your experiences. Um, there's a way into um, some of um, Trump's recent comments that actually are, I found really fascinating when you look at the actual demographics and trending demographics of suburban spaces today in which they are actually, because of the affordable housing crisis of cities, it's actually suburbs that are becoming more and more racially diverse class, like diverse by a number of factors, diverse by income, um, segregated. These, some of these historic segregated suburbs are not, but you're seeing a very much in some ways a kind of parallel to what you did in the early 20th century of a growing siege mentality and fear mentality amongst some of um, the affluent white people who are in suburbs that suddenly are not the exclusive homogenous communities they thought they were buying into as part of the American dream. So that whole appeal to the white, the suburban house size of America, which is, um, is also in some ways um, a statement about growing suburban diversity. Um, right, and, and that in and of itself, I think speaks to how, um, now this talk is about racial capitalism, which is a phrase I have not broached yet, but it's talking about a larger crisis of capital that links the way that segregation in suburbs works, or you can even potentially play up for political gain, and what's happening with essentially things like home values and redevelopment. That's making essentially it harder and harder and harder to live almost anywhere, especially given um, how minimum wage and living wages are not keeping up with the cost of living, especially the cost of housing. So what can be done about that, especially again, in the way that, that is focused on restorative justice and the recognition that this crisis of capital disproportionately affects people based on, on race. Um, well, uh, this is where the purse string things become very interesting, right? So if redlining was able to create, essentially reshape the credit landscape of the United States in a massive way, it seems like there potentially is policy potential 
to reshape um, potential affordable housing measures in a variety of ways. However, so much um, of housing policy actually is, has been devolved to local governments who sometimes either have limited resources or no political will um, to change anything. I think that the answer potentially starts in um, honestly grassroots, grassroots activism, which seems like the most difficult path to massive change. But some of the ideas that inform things such as affordable housing informed ideas such as Section 8, which are housing vouchers and subsidies, which is a program that has become extremely um, corrupt and problematic in terms of the way landlords can operate with it. These were essentially attempts at equity and community reinvestment that started with grassroots ideas that started. And so I do wonder if there, if there is a one size fits all solution, which I don't know if there is, that's potentially a, that's a national policy issue. But I wonder what the local possibilities are um, for things such as using the very tools um, either getting rid of the very tools um, that have been used to historically segregate or somehow reimagining those tools such as zoning to be used to create inclusion and create equity. Um, but does that still solve the fact that people are most likely going to be working in low wage service jobs? No. So how do you essentially take the housing piece, which is a racial segregation story, and how do you essentially have to, to what extent, does that have to be also met with the challenges um, related to schools and jobs, um, college loans? Like, how do you, how does this all fit together? I think that's where you get to this kind of really difficult challenge of you pull one string and you see like a whole bunch of other problems that are sort of fitting together. But where to start? I think we can start with housing. And I think that maybe, maybe local and even state levels can get some victories on path to something national. Mm -hmm. Would you see something like the federal stewardship of an insurance of private capital similar to the FHA into affordable housing or into housing uh, that, you know, doesn't cost an arm and a leg um, as a potential way forward or something that the activists on the street could fight for? Potentially. Um, I think that in theory it could work. Um, investors are often some of the least responsive people to questions of equity, so especially because it gets so potentially capital gets so abstracted that investors may never visit an area or see a person or, you know, or anything, right? Or even know what's in their portfolio. So I think that it's possible. Um, I think community land trusts are an increasingly popular um, strategy for trying to reframe kind of the, the types of home ownership and property ownership that lead to sort of uh, generational wealth disparities and think about how property ownership can be communal enough so that it's actually the stewardship of people who are living there and might pass it on. So I think community land trusts are, are potentially also a thing to look into. I just am not quite familiar with how scalable they are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Before we get to our next question, just jumping on that, what are your thoughts about um, places like Minneapolis or others that have um, uh, removed single family zoning or at least scaled back to allow more mixed uh, housing types? Mm -hmm. um, I think that that can be a very good step, but I also am kind of weary about what does it mean to get rid of single family zoning, but don't necessarily control for a say, the fact that luxury developments can create as many forms of dispossession, even if they're dense apartment buildings. So I think that it's a great start, but I also think that given the, the uprisings um, summer, it seems like that clearly has not solved some very, very major problems that need to be addressed in tandem with um, zoning. And since zoning is one of the main sort of tools that a municipal government could have, I do think it really can be potentially an area of focus um, right, and a way to essentially work with developers to incentivize certain things, even if developers themselves do not care, right? So how do you essentially create intent, right, as we were talking about earlier, but how do you also create a framework for ensuring that regardless of what anyone's priorities are or profits are, they are still going to essentially have to commit to certain forms of uh, integration and equity. And I don't think you necessarily see seen huge successes with that yet, but maybe that's more of a long-term thing. Um, I know in New York, um, there was so much excitement over essentially 
um, uh, regulations that required a certain amount of affordable housing for each luxury development, and then you got corridors um, where you could only enter some of those affordable places for like, you know, a very different um, entrance in the building with limited amenities, and it created a stigma. So those unintended consequences are sort of part and parcel of, I think, figuring out this problem. As a scholar of suburbs, were you surprised by the um, the calls of, um, you know, this invocation of a fear of abolishing the suburbs? <laughs> or, or were you <clears throat> surprised that that which has been, you know, a, an undertone <laughs> all along, but is being actually said out loud? And do you see that maybe there is a backlash to the backlash coming? Hmm. Um, I was not surprised because I think from doing this research, I always expect the worst, um, which may, may not be fair of me, but I, my research is pretty depressing. Um, and then, so, but what I was, in terms of, you raised an interesting point, saying it out loud. I think that actually it's been a huge strategy going back to the Nixon administration and the silent majority to say the quiet part out loud. Um, and that actually has, start, which started as essentially a suburban strategy when suburbs were by and large affluent, segregated, under racial restrictive covenants for the most part. That strategy grew to essentially encompass law and order as a political rallying call, which is essentially has always had not only an anti-urban, but a very anti-black um, thread that gave us mass incarceration that helped to fund the militarization of policing, often targeted at cities. So really, the, so the whole suburban strategy uh, is a very old part of the playbook. What's fascinating to me, actually, is how Democrats have tried to position themselves as not necessarily agreeing with it when it has been a bipartisan um, political playbook for decades now. Um, including, including through the Clinton administration and to some extent the Obama administration. So seeing the sort of attempt at divergence, while also everyone's still trying to appeal to this like mythical suburban, white suburban housewife, is really fascinating to me. Uh, Daniel, would you like to ask your question? Hi, yeah, sure. Thank you so much for this very stimulating talk and um, I'm a PhD student in the anthropology department here and I'm actually researching the financialization of rental housing in Kansas City. Um, and in my preliminary field work, I'm finding um, that TIFs and tax breaks and other forms of incentives are being offered to developers, often they're out of state developers, um, to mm -hmm. essentially incentivize uh, displacement and gentrification because a lot of the organizers that I'm doing field work with are raising concerns of how um, prohibitive the costs are of these new apartments going up that are receiving 10, 20 year tax abatements. So I was wondering if you can expand on on how these, yeah, how these incentives are, are intersecting with, with these histories of racialized dispossession and exclusion that you've talked about. Um, thank you. I mean, I, I'm seeing, I think, um, a lot of what you're seeing, but I was seeing kind of the very early, early versions of this um, back in the, in the 1960s, um, when in essentially redlined areas are areas that are, are much more likely to be um, gentrified areas, precisely because um, right, gentrified areas were areas that were initially appealing to the first wave of gentrifiers because they were cheaper than other places. Why were they cheaper? Because of a long history of disinvestment and um, a disinvestment uh, that also stems from racism. Um, and so what the, that's part of why gentrification disproportionately affects people of color. Um, but also it means that the, it means that potentially redevelopment and say infrastructure provision of zoning, like a lot of that becomes very, it becomes very appealing for investors, but it becomes very expensive because so much has to essentially be done to a, an area that's had 50 years of disinvestment to get it ready for a high rise, con like a luxury condo. So tax abatements, I think, uh, especially, are this sort of really interesting area that now that we, that if we have some kind of 
long-term studies of it show that I think right, on the whole, they do exactly what you describe and that it seems like it's gonna benefit the city of a whole, or at least that's how it's argued, right? A tax abatement, but it generally actually fuels neighborhood level and sometimes city level inequality. So what can be done about that um, is, well, I think that, again, this is where I turn to you guys as uh, the, the planners and, and realtors of, of the future, um, as opposed to the historian looking backwards. But it does seem like um, the kind of classic historian question of, you know, who is being prioritized, right? Like tax abatements for whom, right? Is, um, uh, it seems to be a big issue, right? So tax abatements are supposed to somehow benefit the city, but tax abatements actually hurt um, people who are already marginalized in cities. Can tax abatements be changed to create different incentives? That I'm not sure. Like does the tax abate, do the funding, can funding instead of tax abate, can funding be redirected into very specific things? I don't know. I imagine there's a lot of work done on that that I'm unfamiliar with. But I think that, again, getting into the issue of to what extent can investors be the answer to our problems? Uh, I've yet to really see a lot of strong work um, that kind of counters that, that sort of story of gentrification and increased displacement that you, you seem to be um, seeing really right there on the ground. But I would love counter examples if people had that because I would love to not be the person that was doing the depressing research. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Paige. This was really, really eye-opening and, um, and a little depressing, right? <laughs> but hopefully gives us as planners and real estate practitioners the, the background to move forward and like I said at the outset, to do better. Thank you. Um, and actually, believe it or not, I end my book on an optimistic note mm -hmm. um, after I tell that whole story, which is remember that none of this was inevitable, which means it's not inevitable in the future. Like things can be changed. And it's actually it's you folks who probably are going to be some of the leaders in making these changes if you want to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And let's all, uh, let's all turn on our mics and uh, give Paige a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. You. And again, the, um, I will be teaching a new housing policy class in the spring. Um, and uh, um, Paige is likely going to be in a small group discussion then <laughs> to be determined. But look for that class in the spring if this type of conversation is, are some, uh, uh, is, is appealing to you because <laughs> we'll be doing more of it in the spring. Thank you so much, Paige. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. And everyone, please feel free to um, contact me, reach out if you ever want to continue these conversations. My email um, is out there on the internet. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.